Today's second scripture reading will be read from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, and then turning to the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, verse 7. But Moses said to God, if I come to the... Uh, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the um, Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to all of the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. and then turning to the 20th chapter. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. And then a very brief reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses one and two. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words that are spoken and heard and in our lives enacted be faithful and true and formed by your grace, O oh God. For it is in the Savior's name that we pray. Amen. Hallowed. Hallowed is not a word that we use very often anymore. I mean, except for the Lord's Prayer, and I guess maybe Halloween, or if you're reading Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, when is the last time you used the word hallowed in a casual conversation. Perhaps the mention of the word hallowed brings to mind maybe the college president rising to their feet on alumni weekend at the evening banquet and welcoming everyone back to these hallowed halls. Or maybe we think of Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg when he said, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground, for it has already been hallowed by the blood of Union and Confederate soldiers who gave their lives on this soil. Yes. Hallowed is probably not a word that we use very often anywhere, really, except in church. Perhaps that's the reason for the story about the little boy who asked his Sunday school teacher one morning why God's name was Harold. What do you mean, the teacher asked. Well, said the boy, every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Harold, be thy name. Well, hallowed be thy name is the first petition in the Lord's Prayer. 
But if you think about it, it really doesn't sound like a petition at all. It sounds more like a declarative statement. It sounds as if we're saying, Lord God, your name is hallowed. But we're not. We're actually asking God for something. We're asking God, we're praying to God, Lord, let your name be hallowed. A request is being made here. And this archaic English term, hallow, has to do with holiness, being made holy. It's as if we're saying, please, Lord, let your name be made holy. May your name be honored. May your name be glorified so that everyone may know who you are. Hallowed, holy, be your name. Now, names in scripture carry with them a great significance. And the name of God, especially in the Old Testament, is honored above all others because God is honored, of course, above all others. When Jacob wrestles with the angel, he begs to know God's name. When Moses meets God at the burning bush, he asks, well, what am I supposed to call you by? And God says, I am who I am. That's God's name. It's a verb, it's a being, it's life. And the name of God is so holy in the Old Testament that people won't even say it. In the Hebrew Bible, the name of God, when it's written down, is indicated by consonants. But the vowels are written differently. So that if you're reading it out loud, it's almost like a cue not to speak the name of God. Instead, you say, Adonai, my Lord, because God's name is so holy, we wouldn't want to say it in the wrong way. We, we want to avoid ever using it in a way that doesn't reflect the glory and the honor and the weight it deserves. And it's true, the name of God is held precious by God's people. It's a gift to know the name of God and to be able to call upon the name of God. It's a gift that God protects in one of the Ten Commandments. You remember it? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's a gift that's promised and praised throughout Scripture. The name of the Lord is praised over and over again in Scripture, especially in the Psalms. A few examples would be, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever. Every day I will praise you and bless your name forever. So yes, the name of the Lord is a precious gift. It's to be praised, it's to be celebrated, it's to be kept holy. And that's why Jesus teaches us when we pray to say, hallowed be thy name. But that's not all. When we pray this first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, yes, we ask that we recognize God's name. Yes, it says we are to treat God's name as holy. 
but we should treat it as such in the way we live our lives. When we pray this petition, we ask that we would live in such a way that others, as they come to know us, would also come to revere the holy name of God. In this petition, we acknowledge that we owe God reverence and we are reminded that whether God's name is revered and kept as holy by others is related to directly to how we represent God in the world. When we hallow God's name in our lives, we demonstrate, we promote a favorable view of God from within. And we demonstrate just what kind of God we have by the way we live our lives, the way we live out our lives. What people know about God is really based on what they experience in us. Perhaps this is why the ancient rabbis took sanctifying the name of God and not using it in vain so seriously because they knew, they knew that the very reputation of God was riding upon the kinds of associations people made with that name. Isn't that true? When we hear someone's name, what we think of that person is based on what our experience has been with them. Or take, for example, the word cat. At face value, a cat is a four-legged feline mammal that is a common household pet. But what you think of a cat is based upon your experience with a cat. I mean, suppose your next door neighbor had a fluffy, very sociable, very loving cat when you were growing up. It would jump in your lap and purr and stay with you and just love you. As a result, you would associate the word cat with very positive emotions, like affection. On the other hand, growing up, if your neighbor had a cat who always hissed at you, jumped out at you, clawed and scratched you, you would probably associate the word cat with very negative emotions, maybe like fear. But either way, the word cat makes you think about cats and how you feel about them. It's all about experience. So I wonder, what do people experience of God through my life, through my actions, through what I say? Hallowing God's name is not just a formula of words or some wholesome internal psychology. Hallowing God's name is more than what we do here in this church or when we pray. Essentially, we, holy, we hallow God's name in our daily living. St. Peter Chrysostom just said, God's name is blessed when we live well, but it's blasphemed when we live poorly. Friedrich Nietzsche said, once said, I would believe in your Redeemer if I could see people who live as though they were redeemed. So I wonder, what do people experience of God through my life? 
I think we're all well aware of the fact that there are an increasing number of people who are repelled these days by Christianity because of the Christians they've known or witnessed in behaving in ways that do not hallow God's name. We all know that there are everyday Christians who, who act or who speak in unchristian ways. Their behavior does not hallow God's name. I've met people who can recount the hurt they've experienced at the hands of Christians or in ways which vocal Christians they've known have stood for values which seem to be just the opposite of what is right and just. Even this morning, I've come across numerous comments made by Christian people about the events of last night, which are hardly Christian, which do not hallow God's name. Could it be that this is why Jesus added this first petition to his prayer? So that we might continually ask, so that we might daily ask God to hallow God's name through us. While we as human beings are quite capable of being profane and profaning God's name, it is also true that we can hallow God's name. I'll say it again, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are praying, may your name be hallowed in and through us, in our lives, in our actions, and in our thoughts. You know, back when I was in high school, I was in this United Methodist youth group, and, and we used to sing songs that youth group meetings and, and one of those songs that we used to sing has been rattling through my brain all week. We used to sing a song that went something like, in my life Lord be glorified, be glorified today. That's what we're praying here. In our baptism we are called to live as one who bears Christ's name. We are called to make God's name holy. And we can say and do that with our worship, with our church building, with our music, our traditions that draw us together and to God. We can say all of that, but we also have to say it with our lives. We say it when, in the way we listen deeply and are willing to be moved by people who disagree with us. Hallowed be thy name. In the way we stick with each other when things get tough, we say it. Hallowed be thy name. In the way we respond with faith and patience in the face of widespread fear and panic, hallowed be thy name. In the way we give generously or sacrificially of our hearts and our money and our time, we say it, hallowed be thy name. In the way we prioritize the needs of the vulnerable over our own we say it, hallowed be thy name. When the rest of the world wants to respond with violence and hatred and unkindness, but we know as Christians we respond with love. We say it, hallowed be thy name. In my life, Lord, in all that I say and do, may I make your holy name known.
Last week, I mentioned the name of United Methodist pastor and author Adam Hamilton. Hamilton serves as the pastor of the Church of the Resurrection, a very, very large United Methodist Church in Kansas City. A few years ago, he wrote a book on the Lord's Prayer. And in one of the chapters, he shares the following. He writes, I received a note from one of our church members. She told me how she'd been shopping at Target, buying uniforms and school supplies for the students at area schools that we partner with, schools that serve the most under-resourced communities in Kansas City. He says, we, we provide tutoring, books, school supplies, and uniforms. The woman wrote to say that as she went through the checkout at Target, the cashier asked why she was buying so many uniforms and so many school supplies. She explained to the cashier about our church's school partnerships. She did not mention our church by name, but the cashier said, oh, you go to the Church of the Resurrection, don't you? Yes, our church member replied. Do you attend Resurrection too? No, not yet, answered the cashier. But I've met so many of your members coming through here buying uniforms and school supplies. They're all so friendly. They're so all into what they're doing. And I just love that you're buying all these things for children who need them. Uh, that got me to thinking that I need to get back to church and when I do, I'd like to attend a church like yours. Reverend Hamilton writes, this target cashier knew nothing about our building, our denomination, or our doctrines. Everything she knew about our congregation and the Christians in our congregation was encompassed in her interactions with our members who had come to Target to help others who needed their support. That is what drew her to want to visit, to come and see, as Jesus invited his first two disciples. You see, Hamilton writes, she met people who hallowed God's name. She met people who had hallowed God's name. I wonder, are we among them? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.